Imagine that you're taking your least favorite class of the semester. This class, however, is the class that determines whether or not you go to a four-year university. You believe you're not going to pass this class. No way. Not at least without some help. So you go to a tutor. You tell the tutor whose class you're in, and he immediately pulls out an old textbook that your professor used to use. You're a bit skeptical at first. You believe, but as you start reading through the pages, you realize that most of the topics and concepts are fairly similar. <laughs> Even your friends studied from the same book, and they passed the class. Your tutor convinces you. Yeah, the test is in a week, so you get started and you work with this tutor. Fast forward a week after that first exam, you find out you failed it. 50% failure. Your professor writes on your exam, does not match the new information. The information is updated, sorry. You go to your tutor to tell him what's happened and he's no longer there, so he can't help you convince your professor to retake the test. You're a straight A student. You brush it off and you believe that you're gonna, you're gonna buckle down and you're gonna pass this class no matter what. But that one test brought down your entire class score, two letter grades. Your GPA is now lower than what is accepted at your four year university. Now let me tell you a similar story. My family brought me to the US when I was only two years old. Sometime between then and now, my family was recommended to go to an immigration attorney to get our visas renewed. My family's visas were filed incorrectly. We didn't get our visa renewals. Fast forward a couple years after that mistake. I'm 18 years old and I'm, in a, I'm a senior in high school and I realize that I have a problem to fix. A problem that I didn't create, but I inherited. Most of the schools and scholarships that I applied for spent hours, days, weeks preparing for would not accept me unless I was a US citizen or a US resident. I've lived in the US for 16 years but I'm not considered a resident. I've been through the Duval County public schooling system, K through 12, but I'm not considered a resident. Not, none of the transcripts count, nothing. It's like I don't even exist. The visa I had, either way, if it was renewed or not, would not allow me to further my education here in the United States. And I thought to myself, well, there's got to be some way, there's got to be some way that I can continue and further my education somehow. And luckily, there was a program passed right before I graduated that allowed me to get a worker's permit and allowed me to stay, work, and go to college. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like a miracle. I, I couldn't believe it. But this hasn't exactly fixed the problem. Because now, when my visa expires, the work permit expires, or this program is removed, there's nothing stopping me from being deported. Even though I practically lived here my entire life. I used to think that deportation was reserved for only people who posed an imminent threat, or a threat at all, to the American public, even people with cr criminal records, doesn't matter how serious, just a criminal record would be deported. What kind of weird purgatory have I just stepped into? It was there this entire time. I just didn't know what to call it. I didn't know what exactly it meant and that all this time I was just delaying an inevitable death or deportation to back to my home country. Am I a criminal? 
Am I a threat? I never considered myself one, but maybe I am apparently in someone's eyes. Do, do I need to go back home? What is home now? What is it? Across the wall? Across the border? People who go across the wall nowadays, for the past couple of years, only helped spike this. Asylums in the U.S. have only increased. There's got to be something that's stopping them from, from staying there. And I kept asking myself these questions constantly. Despite having enrolled in FSCJ and now halfway finished with my AS degree, I still couldn't help but ask these questions on a daily basis. Why? Why am I still here? Why am I... Why do people want me out? And maybe not even me, but people like me. It wasn't until I started working with Phi Theta Kappa, the Honor Society, and my college, that they presented me with a topic of borders and boundaries. And I guess kind of gave me purpose and to search for these answers when I just was about to give up on them. And the article that I came across was this one written by Reese Jones. Why build a border wall? And as I was reading this article, I came to understand three things. That the U.S.-Mexico border was created for three purposes. To define its territory, to protect its economic privileges to the U.S. citizens, and to preserve its family values. Nowhere does it say anything about the people who have already lived inside and believe these things. Just that we need to keep these things inside. Well, what happens when an outsider has lived on this side of the wall most, for most of their entire life? And then they're told that that's where they truly belong. Now, perhaps in some sense, they might belong over there. That's where they come from. And since they have nothing to prove that they should remain here, that's where, sh where they should stay. But do you think the people on that side of the wall will realize that? Will they feel the kind of empathy that we feel for each other over here? What does it mean to go back, really? Let me tell you what that's like. Let me tell you what going back means. Let me tell you the story about Elena. She had her younger brother killed by gangs in Honduras. And her mother was killed demanding an investigation. Her family persisted, but nothing happened. She eventually ends up leaving Honduras with two of her four children. Imagine that, having to decide amongst your own children who should go with you, especially after receiving threats of assault, rape, murder, and abduction. Before she reaches the U.S., she calls her husband back in Honduras to see how her other two children are doing. And she finds out that her sons is assaulted the day she left. She finds out that her daughter's not talking to her. She's not answering any questions on whether anything has happened to her because she's too afraid to reveal what she has endured. And then you have Jaren. Now, Jaren was a little bit more like me. He was a dreamer as well. He was brought to the U.S. when he was four, and he pretty much received some bad legal advice as well. The only difference is that he was actually deported back to his home country. And around the same age that I kind of received my papers, which was around 18. Now, at 18, he didn't even know what fear was like until he moved back to Honduras, his home. So, what happens? Well, in August of last year, at 9 o'clock in the morning, he was stabbed in his own house and didn't receive medical attention until 10 o'clock at night. Can you imagine in your own home? Worse yet, no medical advice. So you're just there with a wound. And like Elena in the first story, 
he ends up packing in with a group of friends who are like him to come back to the U.S. and plead for asylum, just spiking up that number again. But of course, we only see them as numbers, not for what they really are. So these immigrants, dreamers, they're not looking for a degree like I'm doing right now or other dreamers here in the U.S. are trying to do. They're not trying to go for a degree, much less a job or even food on the table. They're trying to survive. They're trying to escape this purgatory that they've been put in. Now, what are we to do? Us dreamers here in the US. You could say we could try to go into the legal immigration process. I don't know, find a way, talk to someone, and try to get into that. But where would we start? And certainly when you have a limited amount of time, you don't just wait around a while, not when you're facing deportation. So instead of just explaining what this process looks like, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Take the time and realize that you have these guys staring at you from the other side of the fence. Keep that in mind. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at the screen. Wherever you're looking at the screen, I want you to follow the arrows and memorize everything that you need in order to go through the legal immigration process and at least secure either a residency or a United States citizenship. Go. Okay, time's up. All your visas expired. You, illegal, you illegal, everyone here is illegal. If you've managed to get your US citizenship or residency, you're allowed to stay. Security, please escort everyone who doesn't have a visa or is allowed to stay out of here. No, ma'am, you can't take your car keys with you. Ma'am, drop your purse. Don't take that with you. Ma'am, sorry, sorry. I, I, I don't speak your language. I don't. You don't have a visa. You don't have any other right to be here. That tag on you is expired. Nothing. So you're probably thinking, but that's not fair, Lewis. You didn't give us enough time. You, well, I, didn't, I didn't even get to finish the first sentence. Come on. You, you got to give us more time than that. Or... You might be thinking to yourself, if you've already gotten the message, what am I to do? What can, what can I do to kind of help out in a way? And if not help you out, at least be able to help myself out. Remember the tutor. Remember the immigration attorney. Remember how some bad advice can affect someone. Don't judge, don't label, don't stereotype, but learn, ask. You learn by asking, by listening to the stories of the people who are involved. Don't just listen to the media. How can we expect to go forward as a society if we don't learn to listen to the people around us? Of course, you could say, well, all these stories, I've heard all the stories. And then that's when I realized, even though it's, this is a problem for me, and it is a problem for the other dreamers, I'll, I have to also do my part and try to listen to your stories. Listen to what you're striving for. Listen to what your dreams and goals are. And perhaps there might be someone that I know that I could connect you to, and the same way it goes back. You want to do something in life? You want to help someone? You have to be willing to take that first step and also listen to the other people who are surrounded by you because they also have their own issues. But also realize that you're all, you only help sustain a purgatory when you don't listen to the people that are around you. So instead of disconnecting from the people around us. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go out to the person right next to you. It could be someone far away or someone close. But don't help sustain this purgatory that we're all in together. But start helping to create an Eden. As Chimamanda Adichie said, the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make a single story the only story. So don't just hear.
hear my story, and I won't try to just listen to one of your stories. Try to listen to all of our stories, like I'll try to listen to all your stories, and maybe together we can actually make some progress instead of just bickering over what's the real story. Our stories don't have an ending. They have sequels. They have chapters, pages. But the story must go on. But it only happens when you help each other write it together. Thank you.